is nothing that makes someone who has a family member harmed happier than to look at providers like you, and especially the young ones out here who are going into the field. So thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh, Health Watch USA, and Consumers Union. I never thought I would be here. I am a liberal arts major, and when my son first got um, care for a fall in their garage that we thought was simple, he was seen by a PA. And I wondered what kind of physician is a PA. That's how much I knew. We'd just been healthy. We hadn't seen doctors very much. Uh, so we've been through a lot, but it's really nice to be here and help create a better system. And my parents are really happy about me being here. I drove 700 miles to get here. I stopped at their house. They live in an apple growing region. They sent me with a bushel of apples for all of you. So if you see someone trying to give away apples, <laughs> that's me. And um, it's because my parents are very appreciative of you being here too. All right, so here we go. Uh, this is my husband and me with our son Peter. It's our youngest son. And he fell hard in our garage on an outstretched arm. He screamed, he broke in his arm. We didn't think this was going to impact our life forever. We thought, you know, we'll get this fixed up. We're a really sporty family. We never thought we'd stop playing family tennis, and some of the things we do were impacted. We never thought we'd spend six months at the first medical facility and run into a lot of problems getting medical records. There'd be omissions in them. It'd be hard to figure out what was going on. We didn't know that we'd get four months of consultations and have a hard time figuring out what was going on there. And that we don't know exactly what will happen in the future either. But I also didn't realize that our story isn't that uncommon. And I've gone to Show Me Your Stethoscope, the group in D.C. with nurses from around the country. And when I've talked to my, lots of nurses and tell my story, they, they recognize it's actually not uncommon. A lot of times in big health care, it seems like there's lots of well-meaning providers, but you're moving through this conveyor belt of care where you see so many people really quickly and they're looking at those computer screens and maybe they're missing something and you get moved to the next person and if you're like me and you don't really know what's happening, you can get moved down that conveyor belt for a long time and keep paying the bills but not knowing what's going on. So I've got my email here, it'll be on the last page too. If any of you have questions, feel free to shoot me an email and I share my son's medical records. Okay, so I couldn't be here if it weren't for change agents. If you all are on Facebook, but you're not involved with Facebook groups that are provider and patient focused, write down one or two of the names of some of these groups on the screen. Because one of the best things you can do as a provider is join some groups with patients and providers for perspective sharing. And this can take as little as one minute a week. I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't been able to access social media. In particular, I want to thank Susan Shinazi and ICUER nurse out of California. Susan runs the group Medical Air Transparency Plan. She was injured at her emergency um, facility by a mentally ill patient. And then she was injured by the surgeon who was trying to fix her up. She was healthy before all this happened. Her medical facility pretty much threw her under the bus and she's waiting on a lung transplant right now. But she didn't want to stop being a nurse, so she started this Facebook group, Medical Air Transparency Plan. It was one of the first groups that I joined. And she sent me private messages and told me I needed to get involved with Health Watch USA. The other doctor that helped me is Dr. Lars Arning out of South Dakota because he wrote lots of really good articles that he posted on ProPublica Patient Safety, another great group with doctors and providers. And I recognized that my son's problem sort of happens to a lot of people in different ways. Now, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for these groups and these providers because I actually would have felt it was selfish for me to share my story today. You see, I understand that my son just lost a full functioning range of motion on his right arm. And I would have thought it was selfish to stand here and talk to you because it's only an arm and other people are losing their children. Uh, lots worse things happen. But they convinced me that an arm still counts. You should speak up. You should help this not happen again. And I am really glad to be here. Now, the first time I gave a presentation, it was for Health Watch USA a little over a year ago. And it went great. It was a webcast meeting. It's called a Preventable Adverse Event, a Family Tragedy. It's been listened to over 500 times. It's been listened to from providers from the Carolinas to California. I've got so many emails from attorneys, providers, uh, people who've told me they'll do more x-rays, they'll talk to people more honestly because of my presentation. And I'm super proud because it impacted a New England Journal of Medicine article. 
And I'm a mom, and I'm embarrassed to say this, I had to look up how to put some bandages on in the past. So to talk to you today, um, you know, it's really, it's kind of exciting. <laughs> so thank you very much. So anyhow, you're shifting gears going from a former Surgeon General to me, though, so hang in there. Here we are, here's the first slide. I just want to show you that my son actually had a full functioning right arm prior to his fall, May 24th, 2014, which is a Memorial Day weekend, where he loves sports. He would fall, and it would take me 10 months to get the first x-ray of his arm, of the radial and ulna, to show why his arm never started working again after we got treatment. He has something called synestosis, which is incredibly rare. If he was here right now and he wanted to itch his head, he'd pick his arm up like this, and he would itch like this. So he cannot turn in this area uh, in the elbow. It's frozen. And if he wanted to wave to you like that, it's not possible. This is what it looked like when he was keyboarding and when he was holding things. We didn't know the name of what he had, but we knew something was really wrong. And when he would do physical therapy for four months, we had thought we were supposed to be trying to get his tendons to work, but he could never get his arm to go right. This child had the second longest football throw in his classroom. He loved sports. He worked on this physical therapy all the time, but he started crying. He asked me if the doctor had done something wrong. Then the worst part for me is he thought that I had caused the harm because I must be doing physical therapy wrong and causing this because nobody else was telling us what was wrong. Um, he is very unhappy. Uh, it was showing at school. It impacted his friendships, and we were very upset too. So I wanted to know, well, what is the synesthosis and how did it happen? And I tried to figure it out myself, so I saw doctors all over the country, eventually went out of the country, and I had some providers that helped me um, off the record, gave me a good bit of honesty. I've done a lot of reading, and this is what I've put together. This is what I think could be the potential problems. Day one evaluation and diagnosis. It was a Sunday. It was a holiday weekend. My husband and I took him immediately for help at an urgent care part of a big hospital facility. They took two wrist x-rays and two elbow x-rays, and they conferred without us and said, we're going to send you to an urgent care facility up to the street. It's part of a very large surgical center. They're going to help you there. We've already shared the medical records. But we go up there. The PA who saw us was very, um, a little bit, I don't know if dismissive is the word, but he said, we don't, uh, we don't need to treat this today. This is, I can see what happened. This is a radial head fracture. You'll be seen on Tuesday. My son was splinted up, and we were given a prescription for opioids, um, and we left. But I would learn later that there were two potential problems on this day. Unbeknownst to us, there, was, there were two radiology reports. There was a radiology report at the first urgent care. That radiology report shows that there were three fractures, one to the ulna, one to the humerus, and one to the radial head. There was a second radiology report done, and that was at the second urgent care facility, but that radiology report only shows a fracture to the radial head. The history of illness was different, too. At the first facility, it said that Peter had fallen on his outstretched arm, which was correct. But at the second facility, it said that he had a direct hit to the elbow. And so the problem seems to me that the diagnosis wasn't right, for six, all, actually nobody ever told me, he, the whole time he was treated it was for only a radial head fracture and the history of illness was never changed either, so that was always wrong in the records. On day three when we went in for surgical planning, the facility that we went to hires over 100 PAs, there's lots and lots of medical facilities, so you just get sent to different places, see different people a lot of times. So we saw a new PA. And he said, oh, I can see what happened. I do not need any more x-rays. This is a radial head fracture. We'll fix this with a closed a surgery. We just put the pins through. We'll fix up those bones. We can do this on Monday. That'll be eight days from the injury. And the um, sur general surgeon came in. He rubber stamped that. And Peter was resplinted. We resumed opioids and left. But the next day, Peter was screaming. I mean, pain I've never seen before in my life. He was smashing his feet on the floor. I, I mean, that was awful. I took him to another urgent care facility, and he was seen by a medical office assistant. She said the splint's at the wrong length, and it's at the wrong angle. We will re-splint re him. She re-splinted him, which helped him um, a bit. And 
we left, but now looking back, I think there were some problems on this day because he did not see a PA. He did not see a doctor. They did not take any additional x-rays. And she did not put this visit in the medical records. And my husband travels a lot. He was gone. So I use my iPhone a lot. And I use my iPhone this day also. So this is the only proof I have of the visits, my iPhone picture that you see there. On day eight, he had surgery. But if I look at the medical records, I think we had problems there also. Because it, the surgical report mentions angulation. It also mentions that after the surgery, there's the anteriorization of the bones. Now, I would take Peter lots of places around the country, and I would talk to a doctor out of the country. And a lot of people would bring medical students in to see my, student, my son, and I would hear people talking and try to put things together. I think this is sort of what happened. Uh, I heard people say, well, he should have had more x-rays and evaluation by a surgeon right away. And then they would have, would have done an open surgery really quickly because he was 11 turning 12 and he was growing like a weed. So when the body's trying to heal itself, um, what I overheard is sometimes your body just puts, tries to fix itself. But um, that's bad if it's, everything's not lined up right. So this seems like other people would have done an open surgery and they would have, I was told they would have run pins differently. Um, and not wait so long. And once general, one surgeon said, Peter's general surgeon should have answer the question, why did he choose a closed surgery instead of an open surgery? And another provider told me, well, he probably did the best that he could, and then he thought somebody else could come back and fix it later, but sometimes when you mess too many things up, there's this window and you miss it, and you just can't get things right again. I don't know what happened exactly, but I do know he was in a cast for 24 days, and then when he came out of that cast, his arm never turned over, right? And you saw the physical therapy, four months of that didn't work. And I was trying so hard to get answers because I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. And uh, I couldn't get answers, and I tried sending a certified letter to the physician, the surgeon, and I asked, could he tell me about a medical library because I wanted to start figuring it out on my own. Uh, I couldn't get the answers at that facility, but I started getting consultations. And the first two consultations had the very same problem. Um, both the surgeons wanted to do additional surgery to try to fix Peter up. But they didn't take x-rays or MRIs, so they didn't tell me what was wrong with them. I, I didn't know exactly what was going on, but I could understand I, I've not been told. I don't know what's happened. So I was scared to get more surgery, and I had also, um, I was aware of a book, movie called Full Disclosure. Uh, it's about medical errors by Dr. Stephen Crayman, and um, Larry Crayman, his brother, had, um, I had a little contact with him and had learned about informed consent. I'd never heard of that term before him. It made me realize I probably shouldn't be hopping into more surgery with this situation. I don't even know what's going on. So I got that third consultation was different. Peter sits down, he turns his arm. The surgeon's completely different, doesn't look at any of the medical records, doesn't take any x-rays or an MRI, and he just says synostosis. Come back in four months. So this is in October. He says, come back in four months, we're going to take an MRI, an x-ray, and we're going to tell you what to do then. So we come back in four months, and that's the x-ray you saw at the beginning. That's that x-ray with synostosis. Unfortunately, at that point, he says it's 100%, and we can't do any more, um, we can't do any more right there. So um, he said... The activity is listed as tolerated, and then um, 40, subluxation is 40%. Um, he said that the iotrogenic risk is low, and standard of care was met, and it's a moderate deformity. What was the impact on the family? Um, it was pretty big. We lost trust in big medicine because I had looked all over and I had found one other child with something similar and they had gone to a big medical facility and tried a revision surgery and their child ended up worse. The doctor didn't take the x-rays to show why it was worse or code it that way and they went into personal bankruptcy and their child was worse. So we were really scared to do anything. Peter, physically, he um, couldn't play on a school basketball team anymore and he had to change some of his sports which changed his friends. He was really upset and unhappy. And we had one year we muddled through where we were a kind of a mess. Um, but I gotta tell you, I got the best son ever. He made a lot of adjustments. This is him, this is Peter. He told me one day after school, I'm gonna be a runner, I'm gonna train myself. And I thought, oh my gosh, why didn't I think of that? He found it himself, but that was better because he loves it. He's 16th in our state. 
And uh, he came home one day and he said, you know what, i got to come up with a better professional idea. He wanted to be a vet. And he said, yeah, I think I need to do something where I could use one arm. So now he wants to do something with math because he said I could use just my left arm if I need to. So he's just a fantastic kid, uh, resilient. And my husband Dave, he had nightmares. He had a hard time sleeping when we were going through this. He was sad. He felt guilty. So did I. He made adjustments to the house. Peter doesn't need to use keys anymore. He can uh, ride a bike because my husband got a different bike, different handlebars. For me, it was physical GI problems. My blood pressure was high for the first time. I was emotional. I couldn't sleep. That was for about a year. I, was, uh, I became a patient advocate as a way to do something to feel better about this whole thing. It was just tough on us. But what helped us the most, we got something almost no other families get. We got honesty. It was at about the one-year mark. There was a, a surgeon who took my son's medical records and called me at home for one hour and 50 minutes and went over it. And I found out what happened. I put, I put it together. And that changed my life because I thought I was a bad mom. I thought I was a really bad mom. And it, it was the best thing that ever happened in my life as he told us what happened. And everybody needs this. That night I couldn't believe it. I could sleep again. The next day my blood pressure was fine. And I told my son everything. And he was just a little kid. And he was so relieved. He thought that someone in our family had done something wrong, possibly, too. And then he told me that he was really worried about the cost of all this to the family. We never talked about it. That wasn't an issue. He stopped calling his arms stupid after that day. He stopped smashing on things. He stopped being angry. And my whole family, it just healed us. It, I think providers need the honesty on every single level. I think patients do. And I think there's post-traumatic stress disorder if we don't have it. So what do we do for Peter and others? A lot of people ask, did I do patient questions, um, reported questionnaires? I didn't. They didn't seem well formulated. Clearly, I didn't know what was happening. The school nurse called us in and said, how about a 504 physical disability plan? Uh, they put that in place. We really like it. What about the state medical board? I checked with lots of providers, and they said, don't bother with this. It doesn't work in your state. What about medical facility patient advocates? Really easy to research. I checked on this in my city, my state, and the country. A lot of people... Uh, where I'm living, they feel worse after it. We didn't do it. What about court? We checked with um, attorneys. In the past, uh, this would have been a good idea for us. Um, you would just go to the medical facility, show them what happened. They'd offer a settlement with the attorney. But that changed with tort reform in our state. So now, this isn't worth very much. Uh, you really want... Uh, they don't do settlements for little things. And you would have to take this to court. We'd have to pay. It's a three to five year process. And they don't recommend that we do something like this. We are not going to do it. And the reason is because court cases are really expensive. You see a lot of providers. That's not good. All professions kind of have to look out for their own. And a lot of the providers knew each other by the same name. A lot of them were at the same medical facility. One of them's an expert witness for hospitals and upper arm extremity type things. So, they said, you know, don't bother with the court case. You're that that would be a waste of time and money. Um, also, only 1% of medical errors in my city go to court, and less than 50% of those will win. Uh, nationally, about 7% of people get compensation. So it's really not worth that, but is there something else? And this is the fantastic part. There is social media patient advocacy is growing every day with families like mine. We find transparency through going through the healthcare libraries. We tweet. We use YouTube videos, Yelp and Facebook. Um, I connect with other families. These are two families that have lost their children and they're working with me and other doctors to figure out what went wrong just like I did. We'll get our transparency. The hospitals don't have it for us. We're going to find it. That's the great thing. Now, there's pressure to change from all sides and I'm so happy that this year I was at Show Me Your Stethoscope with nurses from around the country and I got to hear Dr. Marty McCary talk about all the errors we have and isn't that fantastic that a group can bring together providers and patients? Dr. Human Norchasen lost his wife, Dr. Amy Reed, this year uh, to errors, and he started the American Patient Defense Union for people like me. We can't go through the court system, but we can file some paperwork with his group to try to make our family members counted. And finally, I'd just like to say that we're in the 21st century, and I find that fantastic because things are going to change a lot for so many reasons. Think about the way Amazon has changed shopping. You might not like all that, but you can read customer reviews and you can change things. Let each of us work to make the 21st century better with technology in every way we have. And above all, let's be honest. Thank you.